King Two Water at 7 p.m. Uh, tonight's attendance, we expect uh, Ms. Massey will not be able to make it tonight. Um, Ms. Curtin is remote. Let me see here, I'm Catherine. And Ms. Kamersky will be joining us shortly. So with that, if you could please rise and join with your Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. Great, thank you. So just uh, before we start our meeting, um, a little change in the agenda. Typically we do our board form and superintendent report uh, after the public forum and based on information we wanna share regarding the school opening and some of the other uh, areas of the uh, virtual instruction parent survey, we thought we would move those uh, prior to the public forum to give the opportunity to the community to hear what's uh, the update and some of the things that we're exploring as a district. With that, I do see we have Ryan and Katie here from our Columbia Student Council. Welcome, guys. Good to see you. Who's going to start? Um, I can start if Ryan's not ready. <laughs> Sorry, I might lose one uh, in the camera. I kind of took my mic. <laughs> okay. Um, so a couple weeks ago, we had the bridge painting, and that went super well. And we were super excited to spread positive messages throughout the community. And each of the classes at Columbia are going to make, be making shirts that are going to correspond with their class for Spirit Week that we have planned in November. Great. I, I drove by and it looks great on the bridge. Nice job. Thank you. You're welcome. Katie, how are you doing? Good. How are you? Good. And so like Ryan said, we're having a Spirit Week planned for the week of November 16th. So one of the days we're gonna have the classes wear the shirts that correspond with the bridges. And then um, students are voting on the other two days this throughout the rest of this week through our Google Classroom. And then um, our last thing is we are having a student council apparel sale and our website for that is gonna launch within this week. Great. Exciting uh, week with the power outage and things like that, huh? Guys are just <laughs> right on things and uh, probably took some PSATs and all that kind of good stuff. So thanks for all the messaging and all the work you guys are doing. Appreciate it. No problem. Have a great night. A great night. You too. So with that, like I mentioned earlier, we are going to shift gears a little bit and move into um, our board form and superintendent report. We uh, have a report from a superintendent to discuss the update on the school reopening, how things are progressing and then some conversation and exploration around um, some things and feedback that we've gotten from the community and in discussions with our administration, um, how we can look at our plan and to see how we can uh, um, respond to some of the concerns that have been addressed. So I'll turn it over to Mr. Simons. Thank you, Mr. Bino. Uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome board members to our board meeting and welcome our administrative team and members of the community. Uh, we are um, now uh, on the 21st day of instruction. And while we have been open as a school district since the 14th, we've had about 21 days of instruction when you count weekends and the two holidays that we had in Columbus Day and um, also our observance of the Jewish holiday. So uh, I'm happy to report that from a standpoint of both education and health and safety, I think at this point in time during the year, we're doing fairly well. Uh, well, we have had some cases of COVID-19 among students. We have been fortunate that those cases involved students who had not been in school uh, beyond the threshold that is used by the Department of Health to uh, consider an individual a contact. So no students and staff within the schools in each of those cases were determined to be contacts and two of the five cases occurred prior to school opening. So we are in close communication with the Department of Health. The superintendents from Rensselaer County meet through the organization of Quest Arboses every Wednesday with the Department of Health. We have an assigned individual from the Department of Health that handles school district contact tracing. Uh, we talk regularly and she gives us regularly reports on what is happening with students. We're finding that um, the good news is that generally our students' uh, cases are mild. 
they're being cleared by the county within 10 to 14 days. They generally come back uh, after that 14 day period and they're cleared by the county. And we haven't had any students that have had any uh, significant health complications as a result of COVID-19. Um, so from a health standpoint, uh, we do expect that we will get cases and we do uh, expect to continue to work with the Department of Health to make sure that those cases are managed and that the public is informed. One thing I would say before we get into the instructional program is uh, school districts are bound by confidentiality regarding student uh, information and staff health information. We provide as much information as we're permitted to under the state laws. In the event that a student or a staff member was indicated to be a contact of somebody who was infected, they would be notified directly by the county. So that we've had some situations where we send out a general notice that we've had a case and we are in some cases uh, wanting to respond to individual concerns about um, questions that may appear, appear on social media, for example, on our Facebook page. We can't do that by law, but be assured that we would not um, we would not withhold any information that was necessary to make sure that students and staff were protected and safe. If there ever is a question, uh, we encourage uh, parents and or community members to call the County Department of Health directly because they may be able to share some information with you to ease concerns that we are not either privy to or are unable to share. As we um, work within our administrative team and with our teachers regarding the reopening of school. We said uh, at the board meeting when the board adopted the hybrid model that we would continue to evaluate the program uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. We also said at that time that we would be taking a slow and safe approach to September and then evaluating to determine whether or not we would be able to accommodate more days of in-person instruction for our children at the elementary school level, which as everyone recalls, it was a concern uh, throughout the summer when we were having conversations about our reopening plan. Uh, we are in the process of evaluating that along with um, other feedback that we received most recently last evening, a letter was received through uh, the district and the board, which we will put into the public comment record this evening. So if those of you who are here at the board meeting or participating remotely are on board docs, there are some documents that I'm going to review that we've been discussing as an administrative team to determine what we may be able to do to increase in-person learning at the uh, K through five level. Uh, the first document is uh, a breakdown of the district's enrollment. Peter, I don't know if you can put board docs up on the screen without losing anybody. The, the, the agenda. If you can do that, it might be helpful to members of the community that are watching the meeting. Under 4A, Peter, there are four documents that are attached, and I'm on the first document. It's entitled District Enrollment as of 10-9-2020. The, um, the form indicates the current enrollment at all of our schools, uh, including the high school and the middle school. As of October 9th, we had approximately 4,024 children in the district. We are breaking this down to show you the number of students and the percentage of our overall enrollment in each school participating in the hybrid model, which is the two days in person instruction, virtual Wednesday instruction, A group and B group, A group being Mondays and Thursdays, B group being Tuesdays and Fridays. We currently have district wide a little more than 79% of our children of that 4,024 participating in the hybrid program and about 840 students participating in the full remote program, 
So about 20, 21% of the kids on full remote and 79% of the kids in the hybrid. This data is important for us to be looking at as a district because in the event that we want to accommodate more children to participate in the hybrid program, we have to evaluate the impact of the overall enrollment in both of the models on the number of students that we can uh, accommodate within our classroom space and comply with the social distancing requirements, which reduces the overall capacity in our classroom. I want to point out that early on in the process, I, I, I suggested at a virtual meeting that with our community that it would be about 50%. We, we're not, we have not been and we are not using 50% as the rule of thumb. We are using the actual space available in each classroom, which varies by classroom. So for some reason, that 50% kind of got out there uh, as a general parameter, as an estimate, but we are actually counting the number of seats that we can get into every classroom with the desks spaced apart. Uh, the Communication that we received last evening indicated that perhaps we hadn't done that or we weren't doing that. We have been doing that and we have been doing that over the course of the last couple of weeks because we were anticipating at last Wednesday's board meeting, which was canceled due to the power outage, talking about this uh, issue of increasing a person uh, learning. So we have a good handle on the number of kids that are in each of our models right now. The next document um, is very similar, but it takes a look at grade level enrollment across the district. The number of kindergartners through fifth graders district wide, not necessarily in each individual building, and the number of hybrid students in um, each of those grade levels and the percentage. And you can see uh, that we also include the remote numbers and the remote percentage. And this is important because you can see that in some grade levels, we not only have more kids, but we also have higher percentages of children at that grade level participating in the hybrid model. So more seats in the class. Uh, so for example, second grade jumps out at us as a grade level that has uh, higher percentages of students participating in the hybrid model in our K2 classrooms as compared to K1. Uh, we are looking at this data as it um, provides what flexibility is provided to put more students into the class and how could we go about doing that. The options that we are looking at right now, and we have not made any final determinations, and I will not be making a recommendation on the actual option tonight, but I will be talking about our process and I would invite the board's input into this. There's a document entitled K-5 Instructional Plan Modification. So Peter, if you can click on the third document. And I have to thank Mr. McHugh for uh, putting this together and we've engaged our administrators in some discussions today, as well as we've uh, indicated to our teachers union that we will be discussing this. Um, right now, um, we are considering potential elimination of virtual Wednesdays on um, every Wednesday. Right now, our kids K-12 participate in live video virtual instruction. Uh, we have uh, put that in place in part because we wanted to prepare our students and our staff in the event that the COVID-19 cases cause our school district to close or to shift our students to full remote, we wanted the students and the teachers to understand how to deliver instruction through virtual live instruction. And we also negotiated an agreement with our teachers union to study the impact of that and gave our teachers sufficient planning time to be able to operate uh, and learn the technology. Um, option A would involve either eliminating virtual Wednesday for all of the children kindergarten through fifth grade in all of the buildings, uh, or uh, potentially 
modifying that to kindergarten through second grade, for example. Um, if we do that alone, every student in the kindergarten through fifth grade level would receive three days of in-person instruction every two weeks. So it would be an A, B week model. Students would continue to have their hybrid model attending on A days, Mondays and Thursdays, B students attending on Tuesdays and Fridays, and half of the students approximately, the A students would attend Wednesdays the first week, for example, and the B students would attend the second week. So it's an additional day of in-person instruction uh, once every two weeks. Additionally, if we flip through the document and turn to the next page, we are also studying, lost the page. We're also studying an option to My Chromebook is not cooperating. Just got to get the picture up. Okay, option B, uh, and we are discussing this with everyone in the district, would be to uh, keep live virtual Wednesday in place but schedule half of our B group students to come into school for in-person instruction on A days and half of our A students to come in the class for in-person instruction on B days. So on Mondays, Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays, we would have the current schedule that's in place and half of the other group that typically would be currently on remote learning coming in to receive in-person instruction. The enrollment data by grade level that I shared initially is a factor that affects whether or not we can do this in all buildings and in all classroom spaces. The numbers of students in each classroom would increase, uh, but uh, in some cases, in some buildings and in some grade levels, it appears to be feasible based on our preliminary analysis, but in other buildings and other grade levels, it does not appear to be feasible at this point without some further modifications to the, to the program. And in some cases, it might not be feasible at all at some, at some grade levels because of the social distancing requirements. Option C on the third page implements both option A and option B. Under option C, we eliminate virtual Wednesdays for all children K through five and we schedule in half the group of the B kids on A days and half the group of the A, A kids on B days. Okay. This option would provide for the grade levels at which we are able to implement it. This option would provide students with three days of in-person instruction per week and a fourth day every other week because the virtual Wednesday is eliminated. At this point, we don't know that we have sufficient uh, space in every school to do this K through five. And we're still looking at it and discussing it and our principals are really going room to room. We also wanna have further discussions of how this model would impact the instructional planning and delivery that the teachers are doing. It's, it, this is not something that we can implement tomorrow without compromising the instructional plans that are in place for students right now. We need some time to work with our teachers to transition to this. Going back to board docs, there is a fifth handout that I'm gonna steer this to Mr. McHugh uh, because Mr. McHugh has been working with principals on the actual analysis of how much space, what I'm calling is how many seats short are we? Seats meaning chairs can we put in the classroom, kids that we can actually put in the classroom. And from this data, we're trying to develop a plan to look at 
where we can do this, what grade levels, meaning where we can do it, and whether we can do it in all buildings. Mr. McHugh. Sure. So the uh, first page of that document shows uh, a district-wide view. So uh, in kindergarten, for example, there are 17 sections district-wide. Three of those 17 sections are full remote sections, which leaves 14 remaining sections under the hybrid model. The number of sections out of those 14 that meet the social distancing requirements are 11. Three of those sections don't meet those social distancing requirements. However, it doesn't mean you stop there. You look to see what's possible. Typically, the three sections that do not initially meet the social distancing requirement, you're talking about anywhere from two to five students. So um, there could be a day, either uh, any day during the week, where there's a student overage of two to five students. So some of those situations, when Mr. Simons goes further into the report, some of those things can be addressed internally, just meaning that uh, we rebalance the classes within the building. Some of those issues may be able to be resolved by um, possibly removing additional items from the classroom uh, so that we can maintain that social distancing. Uh, at grade one, same thing. You have 16 sections overall, three are full remote, 13 are under the hybrid model. 10 of those 13 sections meet those social distancing requirements, three do not. Again, the, the right-hand column, you're talking about one to three students where those social distancing requirements can't be met. So what we do know is that K-1 is workable. Um, you know, we, we need to do some additional work, but those things are possible to implement either option B or option C. Grade two is a little bit more of a challenge, 14 sections to remote, 12 are under the hybrid model. Only six of those classroom sections actually meet the social distancing requirements. And those sections that do not meet the social distancing requirements, some of those sections, we have an overage of up to six students. So that's a little bit more of a challenge. You're not going to fit six desks into a classroom uh, and maintain that social distancing requirement. So um, again, we're looking at different strategies and things that may be possible to do. And then grade three, 15 sections overall, three are full remote, 12 are hybrid, seven of the 12 meet the social distancing, five do not. And those five sections that don't meet the social distancing, those range from one student over to four students over. So the one with the sections that have one student over, maybe each day or maybe one day, uh, those things are able to be addressed uh, for the most part uh, just by redesigning and rebalancing class. Uh, when we get to grade four, 17 sections, there are um, three remote, 14 hybrid, five of those sections meet the social distancing requirement, nine of the sections do not, and those sections range from one to four. And with grade five, uh, you know, we have 12 sections under the hybrid model, seven of the 12 meet the social distancing, five do not. And those sections range from one to five, meaning that some of those five sections that don't initially meet those social distancing requirements, it could be an overage of five students. That's a tough, uh, that's a tough challenge to remedy. When you're looking at one, uh, you know, those things are workable, but five is, is much more of a challenging number. And then the following documents, if you go to page two, is a breakdown uh, by building. And you can see um, one of the things, you know, and you're well aware of it is well over a year ago, we started to look at our attendance zones and we knew that we had some crowding in some of our buildings like Belltop Elementary School. And if you look, they're short, the range of seats under option B or option C on that right-hand column, kindergarten is three to four students per section grade one, one to three students, grade two, four to six students per section, uh, and all the way up to fifth grade where one of the sections has an overage of six students. So um, implementing social distancing requirements, just to be clear on that. Uh, uh, there is one error on that bell top page. There is only uh, two sections at grade four. Um, I've been crunching numbers for the last couple of days. <laughs> Uh, when you go to third, the third page, it is Donald P. Sutherland. Uh, 
and option B or option C could be implemented um, in both kindergarten and grade one, uh, and then grades two, three, and four become a bit more challenging, specifically three and four, where you're looking at sections that uh, may have an overage of four students under this model. Uh, the next page is Janae Elementary. And uh, kindergarten, you know, the range of seats short depending on the day. So it could be on a Monday um, when you're bringing a percentage of the B students in to join that A group on a Monday, or when you're bringing the other portion of students in on a Thursday to join that A group, another portion of the remaining B students, um, you have a section that uh, is two to three seats short at Janae. Um, the reason that we're digging into it a little bit further is because we're looking at sections in these elementary buildings that may have open seats. So we're gonna present the data, but there's pros and cons to no matter what you do. Um, some of this plan could be addressed internally. Some may require a child to be moved from the teacher that they have been with since we opened September 14th. And when we implement this plan, they would have a new teacher. Now, the other side of that is the curriculum maps that we've put a lot of effort into over the last several years helps because we have really diminished the likelihood of a child sitting in one classroom in our district um, and being uh, covering a certain part of the content or the curriculum, going to another section and seeing something different. Our, our Ks are very similar no matter which kindergarten classroom you go into district-wide, and that stays true K through five. So that's helped a little bit, um, but we are looking and we're aware of where we can remedy some of these challenges, and depending upon how far you wanna go, some of it could really be that a student that was with a particular teacher for the first part of the year now would have to be moved into another classroom with another teacher. Um, we also are well aware of the marking periods. There's three marking periods. The first marking period ends November 16th. Um, so those things are all relevant of when to break that and implement something new. Uh, but you can see um, the challenges associated with Janae Elementary. We can meet the social distancing requirements in grades one, two, and three at Janae. Uh, grade four and five, uh, depending on the day and the section, uh, we're over by anywhere from one to three students in those two grade levels. Uh, the next slide is Green Meadow specific to that building. And we can implement uh, plan option B or option C, K12. Uh, Green Meadow can handle that internally. And then there's a challenge where we're over by section. We, we average somewhere between one and two students over. Grade four, one student over per section. Grade five, one student over per section. And the last page is Red Mill Elementary where you can see that uh, we, we can implement option B or C in kindergarten um, and maintain social distancing requirements. Grade one, we're two students over, we average two students over per section. Uh, grade two, we're four to five students over per section. That's a greater challenge uh, to address. So um, there are some other options and we'll address those, but uh, that's a bigger challenge to overcome. Any questions on that data in front of you? Um, the other thing that I will add is we've taken a district-wide view of this as well. So we looked at all of our K sections as a district uh, and we took the open seats and uh, where we were short seats and had we've got an idea of, of again, how many seats were short in, in these grade levels, which also becomes a challenge. But uh, when we're asked to dig into this as deep as we can go, uh, one of the options that we could be faced with is that we can open it up and increase in-person learning time, but some students may have to leave their elementary buildings in order to do that at certain grade levels. So uh, the last point I want to make under these options, A, B, or C, there's options within each option, right? So we could decide we're going to implement one of these options at K-1, where we're able to or and then further explore another grade level um, or you know we implement one of these options straight through k-5 uh, the other part of it is that we're well aware and and, and um, i i have a review of the uh, survey that we put out to our parents 
And that's really the surveys. A lot of times people say, you know, you survey us, but what do you do with the data? We started to do this research as a result of that survey. So, um, you know, we're well aware that uh, one of the challenges is establishing consistency in a routine. So we're respectful of that too. We realize that any of these options, depending upon how it was implemented, could change that schedule and change that routine, which is an additional challenge and an additional burden for our community. One thing I would add on yeah. routines is we've, we've been having discussions, not only of the routines of the students, which is the most important, uh, but we, for example, we met with our kindergarten teachers uh, last week to discuss how things were going. And we did talk about topics such as virtual Wednesday and the, how the, how the instruction was going on the remote days and so forth. And from the kindergarten teacher's perspective, they were saying that they just felt like this last week or so, kids were starting to establish those routines and uh, responding. Um, but there's also the routines from the perspective of the teachers and there's the routines from the perspective of the parents. And what, we're, what we've been hearing is in some cases, the routines of the parents are very challenging, particularly on virtual Wednesdays or whoever the caregiver is to support the students in remote learning, particularly at the early elementary levels. So all of this has to be weighed in the balance of what we do, impact on students, impact on parents, impact on the staff's ability to be able to deliver effective instruction. Um, the other, the other um, variable involved when we uh, look at the analysis of the number of spaces we could accommodate for additional kids is uh, even at the K-1 level, as Jim alluded to, um, Belltop is short. Um, there might be a perception out there within the community that all classroom spaces are not being utilized. And in cases of some buildings, that would be true. Uh, and the reason that that is uh, happening, for example, we've maintained in the elementary schools art rooms, music rooms, because once we reviewed whether or not we were gonna move a grade level out and create more, um, if you remember the analysis, we did the number of rooms we needed, the number of staff members we needed, teaching assistants and TAs, we concluded that we did not have sufficient room and we could not, even if we had the budget to accommodate it, hire all the staff, I think it was in the neighborhood of 37 teaching assistants. So once the decision was made to implement the hybrid, those rooms became available again. It wasn't as though we could use those rooms to accommodate more students without filling it with the staff. And it was the staff. So those rooms are available. So in the case of Belltop and perhaps some other schools, if we move in this direction, we may have to look at changing the model of instruction in some schools. For example, Belltop with two sections of kindergarten could divide those two sections of students up into groups of three, use the art room hypothetically to manage that group, but we would need a staff, we need a staff member to work with that kindergarten team, and whether that's a teaching assistant or uh, that's uh, currently in the building or whether, we, whether or not we would provide that as additional is a factor that we have to consider. We've already hired 10 teaching assistants to, to accommodate the middle school and the high school uh, schedule to be able to offer full classes to the kids. So we may be hearing from parents, and it would be true that in some buildings they are not using the maker space, they're not using the art room. That's true because when we decided to do the hybrid model, it was a factor associated with both the number of rooms we needed district wide and the number of staff members we needed. So once we went to the hybrid, those rooms were still used for the purposes that they were used last year. It doesn't mean that we can't think about and do something to be able to bring more kids in and what's being proposed here. We just may need to have the model look a little different in some schools that don't have sufficient uh, seats within those existing sections. Mm -hmm. right. Does that make sense? It does.
Um, so that's this is where we're uh, headed in this direction. I think we would like some time as an administrative team to continue to work on this. We'd like to update the board on it at next uh, Wednesday's meeting. Uh, we met with the administrative team today and took a look at this. From a busing perspective, Mark Noeth has indicated that the additional, putting the B kids in on A days and the A kids on B days, given the ridership that we have right now, is feasible. From a lunch uh, program, breakfast program standpoint, in terms of the number of meals we serve on those days, that's not going to be an issue. The space in the cafeteria to manage social distances in some buildings may be an issue, and we still have to look at it some of the smaller buildings. Okay. But um, right now, we're fairly encouraged that we may be able to do this as a starting point at K-1. When I say do this, I mean eliminate the virtual Wednesday at some point. We can't, we can't do it next week for all K-5 students and focus on trying to get more kindergartners and first graders that additional third day of in-person instruction every week and the, um, all the K-5 kids, the additional in-person instruction every other week through the AB week implementation and the elimination of virtual Wednesday. We're not ready to say we can completely, uh, with a level of confidence, do it without some problems, uh, and we want a little more time to work on it. Okay. Is there any questions, uh, Michelle, Kathleen, board members here present regarding the what was outlined? No, not at this time. I think, um, you know, like, like Mr. McHugh said, we, we gathered the survey data, and we had hoped to present that last week and the district administration has been looking carefully into this information and working through options so i think that continue to study what we have it's it's it sounds like you really took a deep dive into it and we appreciate all the work that's going into it um i think our community has to understand too that the amount of work that goes into looking at all these different variables whether it be transportation food uh, staffing, you know, there could be additional expenses that uh, will be incurred if we go to some of these models. And that's a, that's a big decision for us based on the economics of what the district uh, may face in the future. So that's a decision that, um, you know, we'll, we'll take very seriously. Um, I think given next week, we'll, we'll have some more information yes. be able to kind of really parse this out. I think the other piece is the, um, you know, 20%, 21% of our students are remote. And you know, we have an obligation as a community to educate those children. And if they choose to come back into the buildings, that also impacts what we can do. Thank you, Mr. Buono. I forgot to mention that. I was going to mention that we have a survey ready to go that we wanted to have this discussion first that will go to all of our students' families on full remote tomorrow. And we had said in August, as part of our reopening plan, we would provide an opportunity for the full remote students to come back and participate in in-person learning. We don't know what the intentions of those families are right now. So we're gonna be asking them, are they planning to uh, continue on full remote? Would they, are they considering coming back for the second marking period for the second semester? The other thing that was brought up today by one of our principals, which was a good idea, and we're gonna modify the survey was uh, to gauge whether the decision would change if we change the hybrid model to three days of in-person learning, they may be less comfortable uh, with that. Um, you know, we, we recall hearing from some parents right. in August that they were, they had a level of confidence that their students could come to school because the hybrid was only two days of in-person learning. If we move right. it to three, there might be some families who are sure. currently participating in the hybrid who may have some concerns about that. And there may be some concerns from the remote parents that who were intending to come back that, mm -hmm. uh, that they may uh, make the determination that they'd stay on full remote. So this survey is an important piece of data that we need to be able to figure out what the true enrollment would be next marking period mm -hmm. for in-person learning. 
was there any consideration thinking that if you have an increased number of students coming in every day, the, you know, the, the check-ins in the morning and the temperature checks and those kinds of things? It, it does increase the number of students that we have to conduct those safety drills for. I think it's fairly feasible given okay. it's only, it, right now it's, it's not going to be a major issue at the elementary school uh, level. The, um, the, the issues are really about, you know, classroom space and sure. making sure that okay. students and staff are comfortable and parents are comfortable with the social distancing. We, I have said to principals that we will not relax the social distancing requirement or the New York State Department of Health guidelines in order to do this. Um, the rule is written as when uh, students are to be wearing masks when unable to socially distance. Our rule has been you will wear the masks and socially distance wherever possible. In other words, there, there's incidental situations that occur uh, and you will have mass breaks. So we aren't going to um, load the classes up with additional kids in ways that make those desks closer together or where students are encroaching on one another within the six feet rule. Mm -hmm. okay. Nor will we recommend adding any um, plexiglass and or other dividers to be able to shorten that distance. We do have those in place in some places, but we haven't used those as a general rule. I'm just bringing mm -hmm. that up because that came up as part of the Q&A during the reopening plan. Right. We want to be able to accommodate more students in a way that maintains the current health and safety procedures that we have in place. Because overall, we think they're working very well and we're working through the questions. Yeah, yeah, okay. And I do want to reiterate that, <clears throat> you know, when we studied all this, uh, you said, Mr. Simon said, 21 days in of instruction mm -hmm. so far. Um, Virtual Wednesdays was designed to support our staff and our students. Should there be a shift, um, we're grateful that the cases in this region, in this area particularly have been fairly low, mm -hmm. but we're seeing things happening in local districts particularly at the middle high school, where there is a um, positive case and, and students are quarantined and staff are quarantined. So we're taking all those precautions very seriously. Um, I think a, a approach like this, starting with uh, some of our younger learners who may need more in-person instruction, um, and if we can provide that, and then if we can you know, continue to look at that, I mean, that's part of our plan to, again, provide the best quality instruction given the circumstances of a pandemic, which no one has been through, including our staff and our parents and our kids, and to make sure that we do it safely, we do it well, and when we can adjust, we can adjust. Okay. So I want to assure the community that, that this is something that we talk about and think about frequently. Okay, so we hear you. Can I just make the point? Yes, John. One of the things glad to have this conversation. I think it's important to have the conversation. But what I think it's important to always remind ourselves what you said, that we cannot and will not compromise the integrity of the plan and the safety protocol. The reason that the few cases that these kids have had come up have been dealt with without disruption is because we are following the rule and we're not pushing the envelope to play placate to people who, who think, there's always gonna be a group out there that thinks their group is being shortchanged more than the other group. And the, and the ultimate is the safety of the kids. And as we go in, the news every day is saying there is an uptake nationally. And at some point in time, it's gonna come here. And it's just not the end of the world, and I don't mean that, it just means that we have to be prepared for it. And I think that disrupting the system that's working to a point where you're trying to force a, a square peg into a round hole when common sense just dictates the smooth transition that you're trying to achieve. This is a long range plan. And unfortunately, there are gonna be some people who are not happy with the uh, speed that we move forward. But the speed that we will move forward is the speed that is safe for the entire community, staff, students and everyone. So I just wanted to make sure that we, we continue that focus.
for the community to hear that we're, we're hearing what they're saying, we're looking at the surveys, but at the same time, we have to look outside the box as well. And I, I, I thank you for, for getting out in front of this issue because at some point in time, we will have to transition into something, whether it be one way or the other. So thank you for, for that effort and the information. One thing that Mr. Buno mentioned was the ability to implement the procedures um, one thing I just want to share, and it really isn't anything that is a predicate for changing the program or increasing in-person learning, but the volume of tracking that the nurses are doing through the principal to my office, through Marissa and Molly, regarding students who come to school symptomatic or, or become symptomatic in school who need to go home or staff members, it's a significant daily volume. I, in, in order to uh, make sure that the nurses can manage cases, students isolated, sent home for evaluation from a physician, and if ordered by the physician, the negative COVID test results before they can come back. All of that data that flows from children being sent home or staff members being sent home comes through the nurses to the principal, to Marissa, to Molly, to my office, and I report it to the state. So anyone can go on the school report card and look at our data right now. And one of the data sets is uh, students referred to a medical provider or the County Department of Health or a staff member referred. That number is pretty high mm -hmm. uh, on a daily basis in school because kids get runny noses and coughs kids get uh, gastrointestinal issues. I don't believe that putting more students into the K-1, for example, would significantly overburden the system, but I, it, it is a monitoring tool that we're utilizing to keep the climate of the schools healthy and safe, and it does require a lot of work. Mm -hmm. It's not, a, it's not, a, it's not, it's, it's important work, but it does, when you have more kids in the school, mm -hmm. you're more likely to have more trips to the nurse's office, more kids who may need to be isolated, more parents that need to be contacted to go home, and more monitoring of the number of kids and staff, kids that have to shift to full remote, because remember, we have to put them on full remote as well. Right. So there's a lot of fluidity to all of this that we're managing on a daily basis. That's pretty complex. Mm -hmm. yeah. It is. I know that Mark, Mr. McHugh wants to report on the survey too. So. Mark had a question. Uh, just a comment. Comment. It's, it's, it's a topic of a couple of our board meetings is that you know New York State itself puts some uh, hefty restrictions on the state. Yep. And uh, as we all know, um, our state leaders are uh, sometimes more tough than other states. Mm -hmm. And if you look down the state already, uh, our state leaders are, are starting to close by zip codes. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be the new model yeah. that the state is going to use. Yeah. It, um, and, and it's starting. And, and they are starting to close schools and shut down businesses and stuff like that. So while you know, our guidelines were really being also dictated by New York State, right? We follow New York State Department of Health guidelines. We follow the state aid guidelines. And we also have to follow what the, what the governor in New York says. The governor in New York says close, you close. And if the governor in New York says you'll do this, we do that. And, and we are in a state that is um, quite strict, uh, maybe more than other states. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, there's a, a press conference that the state had, and, and New York State numbers are lower. And, and I think it's because of, of the, the, the strictness. And, it, and it's a pain that everybody's doing. Um, and, you know, as a district, we're going to do our best to, to you know, do what's, what's right for the kids and, and get them the education that they need. But there are times when our hands are just tied and we can't do something. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Anyone else? Comments? Well, thanks for the conversation, and we'll hear more next week. We appreciate the community's input um, that we received so far, and we'll, we will be doing a public forum 
after Mr. McHugh's uh, review of the survey. Mr. McHugh? Yes. Yes. Just uh, quickly walk you through uh, some survey, a summary of a uh, couple surveys that went out. So we first surveyed our 6 through 12 parents on September 18th regarding live virtual instruction on Wednesday. The following week, we, sur we surveyed our K through 5 parents. That survey uh, closed on September 23rd, or I'm sorry, it went out on September 23rd, closed September 29th. Um, what we realized is we got better in one week time. So, um, for example, 6 through 12, 53.8 percent of our parents responded that their child was able to actually um, connect live on Google Meets. And a week later, um, that percentage went up to 87.2 percent. And I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit. But, um, you know, we, we did get better at that. So as the result of our first survey with our 6 through 12, the following actions were taken. Uh, you know, contrary to what anybody thinks, uh, all those comments are read. Uh, the K-5 comments were 47 pages. I have that memorized and ingrained in my mind. Um, wow. But they were summarized and, and we shared them with our stakeholders. So those, those comments and those survey results went out to our teachers, our administrators, our support staff, our technology department. Uh, our director of technology, Mr. Goodwin, uh, really checked in on connectivity issues because um, when you survey any group, you look for a large number of common responses. So uh, there's a lot that can filter out. I kind of call them the things that fall under the Goldilocks rule, you know, too hard, too easy, too long, too short, um, too much, too little. So those are hard things to really address and alleviate. You're always going to have that perspective. But you look for things that are common. And some common things that came out of that first survey was there were some connectivity challenges. Um, so. We really uh, did, did some research. When I say we, I mean Mr. Goodwin and his team did some research, and we really discovered that it was not an, an internal network issue. It was an outside issue related to Google. Uh, that's good to know where that issue is. Uh, however, our tech department uh, under Mr. Goodwin's leadership removed some of the Chrome extensions, and they cleared the cache uh, from devices, and that helped. Um, Additional steps that were taken, we ordered 425 web cameras. Approximately 70 were installed at Columbia High School, approximately 60 at Goff Middle School. And uh, recently, those web cameras were distributed to our K-5, our elementary buildings. Approximately 85 Khajiit uh, smart spots were disseminated throughout our community to families that stated they had a connectivity issue. So uh, the district supplied them with that, and that uh, helped tremendously. We checked back in. We monitored the following week for live virtual instruction. They had no connectivity issues. Uh, common things that came out. So when I talk to you about common themes, um, the common theme was that it was a tremendous challenge for everyone. Uh, so it was a challenge for our parents. We understand that. It's a challenge for our teachers. Uh, it's a challenge. It's a challenge for everyone. Uh, we do talk of quite a bit about uh, developmentally appropriate. What's appropriate for a five or a six or a seven-year-old? We realize that that's really adult dependent, right? Uh, a K, grade one, grade two student, they're not gonna get up and they're not gonna log on to that computer and uh, stay engaged for a period of time. We, we're aware that the attention span ranges about one minute for every chronological year of birth. So a five-year-old, you, you got five minutes and, and we're aware of it. Those are all challenges, but like what has been stated, we need to be prepared to make that shift at any time, right? So the state, the county could shut us down and say you're in full remote. So there is some value in that live virtual instruction because the reality of it is we could be forced to be in that at any time. Uh, with that said, you, you know, it was, it was a common theme that our parents wanted more live instruction, more live in-person instruction. And that's really what started the work that uh, Mr. Simon spoke of earlier, really looking at eliminating that live virtual instruction day on Wednesdays, possibly for K-5, or maybe looking at eliminating it K-1-2. We're still working on that. Uh, but that is in response to that common response that we got out of that survey. Um, you know, some other takeaways, and, and this is valuable information for our instructional staff and our um, is that, you know, they really wanted a consistent approach. So 
how we post links and how we post <coughs> assignments. The primary platform is Google Classroom. Um, you know, we did hear that that was problematic for some of our parents that we serve is that they have multiple children in the house and they're going to Google Classroom or they're going to a newsletter or they're uh, getting a link in their email that they really would appreciate that common approach to how we disseminate that information. Um, found tremendous values in the post posted recording of lessons. So, you know, when we talk about our youngest learners, uh, could be a single parent home, could be uh, two parents home, but both working, no one able to sit with that child at 9 a.m. So that recording comes in really handy for when it's a convenient time for that asynchronous learning that the parents can help support their child later in the evening at a time that works for them. So we know there's value in those recordings. Um, we realize that many students still don't want to put their face on that camera. And, and that's important for our teachers to know, um, especially if we're counting attendance as being able to to see that student in that classroom, there are still students that just don't wanna put that camera on for a variety of different reasons. So cons consistent routine, consistent schedule, consistent start and end times, all make things a little easier for our parents. Um, there was some common uh, perception that there was an inequity amongst A days and B days. We released that document, Mark Adam put that communication out, but that's not an accurate statement. We did make an adjustment to the schedule this week to account for the power outage closings uh, and the holiday that was the prior Monday. So um, we also had a common theme that uh, our students and our parents found it difficult to hear the teacher. The web cameras alleviated that and addressed that issue. Things have gotten a lot better with that. Parents also requested um, and asked us to consider making sure that we establish virtual classroom etiquette. So when the microphone should be on, when the microphone should be off, what they're hearing in the background on high virtual Wednesday, or possibly even what they're seeing, um, but just establishing that etiquette of how students should behave and conduct themselves, what the chat room should be used for, what it shouldn't be used for, uh, all valuable information. Uh, a little bit of confusion regarding two things, office hours as part of that live virtual Wednesday. Um, some parents, uh, requested that that information be shared again because that differs by teacher. For example, our 6 through 12, the office hours, uh, for the most part, supplement what would have been their non-instructional classroom assignment. So it could be a study hall and now it's office hours and that's different for every one of our faculty members. So um, ask for that to be communicated again. And typically that's done during open house events. Teachers hand out a class syllabus, how they grade, that information would go out as well. And then a little bit of confusion of what was required work and what was optional work. So some teachers have implemented choice boards, have re referred students to go to a choice board to select an activity, just a clarification of what's required and what's optional. The last couple of things I just wanna hit upon is that I think it's really important that folks realize that we've had over a hundred Chromebooks that needed to be repaired. So. Our technology team, Mr. Goodwin and, and uh, three techs, uh, there's been over 100 Chromebooks that were in need of repair. So trying to balance connectivity issues and other uh, issues with uh, desktops and Chromebooks, plus the student repairs, uh, it's been a challenge for our department. Trying to do that in a timely manner, our students take priority because they're dependent on that device, uh, but our folks have been spread pretty thin and have done an amazing job. Uh, I also want to note that our technicians have gone as far as making house calls. So we've had connectivity issues, we've had uh, hardware issues, and our tech team has gone out and made house calls, which I think is pretty impressive and sometimes gets lost in the big picture. Um, the other thing is that our parents can benefit just as much as we can from some of our tech professional development. There has been an inquiry regarding some professional development for the, our community around technology and the establishment of a help desk of who to call when we have a problem. Is it a simple diagnosis of an actual Chromebook issue or is it a connectivity issue? Implementing that help desk, uh, something that we've been considering for a while, it's just uh, tough to do it right now, um, but uh, serves as a good purpose. So any questions? Thank C you. Comments? I think, um... What was the response rate, Jim, on the survey? On the survey? Yeah. Uh, 
820 parents responded uh, to our 6 through 12 survey. There were 347 comments uh, and 400, or I'm sorry, 853 sure. parents responded to our K-5 survey and there were 451 additional comments Great. with that survey. Great. So feedback, you know, the surveys are being done. The feedback is important. And then you can see the results of some of that uh, survey data and how it can play out in terms of helping um, our teachers, our, our parents, and um, our kids in terms of how we adjust and change. And again, the, working through all the issues, technology issues, setting routines, all those things that come with starting school, especially since being off for several months, um, since this all started back in March, actually. Uh, we've come a long way as a district, and uh, I think our investment in planning technology has, has really paid off, and I appreciate the administration responding to the parents, and I encourage parents when those surveys come out to continue to respond and give us the feedback, because that's the way we're gonna understand as a large group um, what, that, what you're trying to share, what you're trying to tell us um, through your principles and through surveys, obviously, will help us a lot as we uh, continue to adjust and shift as needed. So thank you for that and appreciate everyone's participation. Any other comments out there, Kathleen, DM, uh, Michelle, good? Okay. Mr. Bruno, can I add a, one thing? Yes, Mr. Simons. To, to reinforce um, what you're saying. We can fix a lot of problems on an individual basis for your children or for you as a parent trying to support remote learning or virtual instruction if we know about it. So I've gotten a couple emails recently where there's been concern brought to me that the child was having problems with connecting or with a remote learning piece. And we are, we are encouraging parents to ensure that the teacher knows about the issue. We may not know an issue uh, that your child is experiencing on a virtual Wednesday or a remote day uh, unless you bring it to the attention of the teachers. And we try to fix problems at the level that they can be fixed at, at the lowest level they can be fixed at. So the first step would be email the teacher, okay? Well, in some cases, we, we want families to understand that that teacher may not immediately be able to get back to them in that day because they're teaching their class. So on a virtual Wednesday, they're teaching kids virtually. On a, if your child's on a B day, the other kids are in person on an A day, the teachers are teaching the class. They, they will get back to you during the office hours, and they also will get back to you as questions come up. In the event that the problem can't get resolved or you're not getting a response, then we move it to the principal. And we've asked our principals to intervene to try to solve problems for kids and parents. If the principal can't solve the problem, you move it up to the central administration, either my office or Mr. McHugh's office, and we will ensure that individual problems get addressed. But we don't want students to struggle or be frustrated or parents to be frustrated for problems that we may be able to fix just simply by knowing about it. We've done that a lot with Chromebook issues, with other connectivity issues, with curriculum issues or questions about what the expectations are, but uh, we encourage you to connect with us as soon as you know there's a problem so that we can fix it. And I saw recently that we rolled out our home, our tablets to our younger learners. So that was great to see the, um, the staff preparing those. And that's another resource to provide our, our parents and younger learners to, uh, to learn. If there's no final comments, I'll move to the, uh, the public forum. Residents, students, <clears throat> employees, and business representatives of the East Greenwood Central School District may address the board on matters concerning programs and or operations of the district other than matters involving personnel. Members of the board do not directly respond to citizen concerns during the public forum. If a response is appropriate, either the president or superintendent will contact the individual in the near future. Those persons wishing to address the board will be recognized by the chair of the meeting and should state for the record their name, address, or affiliation with the district or business. While the board does not wish to infringe upon the free speech protection, it must be stressed that the visitor's forum is not deemed to be an open forum. The board president will conduct the forum for the orderly and efficient operation of board business. In addition, any remarks which may be considered defamatory or stigmatizing or prohibited, they will declare it out of order. So we have set up, as we have for several meetings now, the email 
for uh, the community and public to email the comments in. If we can address it, we will. Uh, if not, we'll make sure that we get back to you. So, um, as always, we turn it over to Linda to, what, what does it look like? Okay, thank you. We have two emails. Two emails, okay. Uh, the first email is from Alyssa Blaustein, who is a parent of a CHS student. And it's really, it's not a question, it's a comment. Uh, she is saying that she does not have a K-5 student, but she thinks that in the interest of equity, the only option of the three presented that would make sense for K-5 is option A. And the other students, uh, the other options seem a little too cumbersome. Thank you. The next question is from Melissa DeLuca. She'd like to know where, what are the New York State guidelines for spacing of children's desk? Is it six feet from the center of the desk to the center of the desk? It's not that specific. Okay. Uh, there are several more questions okay. here uh, from the same parent. She would, um, she's commenting that almost all of the surrounding districts are able to provide a five day a week in person learning for grades K through six. She works in one of them and they are using TAs to take the additional section per grade level. The certified teachers rotate into the TA's class to teach the content areas. In another building in the district, the reading teachers each have a cohort. Uh, they have all different class sizes as well as based on each individual space and what can safely be accommodated per the New York State guidelines of six foot. Can we use the cafeteria as cl uh, classroom spaces and the students can eat in the classroom in elementary? I'd like to respond to that. Sure. Okay. So we presented an analysis uh, for our parents at a community meeting prior to recommending the board reopen our schools under the current K-12 hybrid plan that showed that looked at that very option that was described that Gilderlin and other districts have implemented. In order to do that, we showed that we would need to move the fifth graders out of their home schools and either into the middle school or into a separate campus location. And we even explored Hudson Valley. That option also involved uh, still lacking sufficient classrooms and staff at both the K-4 level and the fifth grade level and would have pushed eighth grade up into the high school where we did not have sufficient um, ability to offer all of the courses for eighth graders and high schoolers in order to be able to do that. Uh, so we looked at that exact model and we determined that it wasn't feasible for East Greenbush. We also counted the number of classrooms and teaching assistants that we would need to implement that, and it was approximately 37 teaching assistants. The factors that affect individual districts include the enrollment of the district. Our enrollment is actually smaller than Gilderland at the elementary school level. Um, however, some of our buildings may be smaller. Uh, the Gilderland model also involved shifting a grade level out of the elementary schools into Farnsworth Middle School, as I understand, at least that's what's on our website. And also a modification to the elementary schedule that involved bringing, our kindergarten, bringing the kindergartners uh, in at 7.30 in the morning uh, and releasing them at approximately 1.30 or 1.40. And then the, then the, um, then the three, four kids coming in uh, later and staying later and the high schoolers were, are dismissed now, as I understand it, around 420 in Gilderland. So uh, we looked at all of those various approaches and from an enrollment standpoint, a space standpoint, a budget standpoint, and a transportation standpoint, we simply couldn't replicate what was being done in some of those other districts. We also want to preserve the integrity of our academic invention services program, our art program, our music program, physical education program, and ensure that the roles that our TAs are assigned to are TA roles, not teaching roles. So all of those factors went into consideration to do what we felt was best for East Greenbush. Gilderland has to do what Gilderland thinks is best for Gilderland. 
Thank you. There are no other, no other comments or questions. Thanks, Linda. You're welcome. Any uh, other comments, board members, before I wrap this part up? Okay. Appreciate the community input, and as always, um, as many of you know, you know how to get hold of us. Right? Thank you. Moving to the next section is the discussion items, and one of the things we wanted to look at was the impact of the COVID-19 on our student and staff attendance, and you touched upon that, Mr. Simons, earlier about um, the work the nurses are doing to monitor student and staff uh, health and the um, numbers there. So I'm going to turn that over to Marissa Cannon. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Cannon. Let's grab a microphone, Marissa. Thank you. Mr. Goodwin, could you pull up that report on the screen if possible? Student and staff attendance discussion item. 6A. Thank you. It was necessary for our administrative team to take a look at how COVID-19 policies and or concerns might be impacting our student and staff attendance for the first few weeks of the current school year. There are several requirements to ensure that symptomatic staff and students stay home, seek medical care, and in many instances, um, go for COVID testing and await those testing results. Um, and some individuals might be um, in mandatory quarantine. So we took all of that into consideration. We analyzed data for the period beginning September 14th, which was our first day for student instruction through October 2nd. And we looked at the student absences on the A day, B day, virtual Wednesday, and remote. The data used to develop the report regarding student absences is provided through a system called Power Tool, which is our district's student information system. So when we look at our absences, it's important to know that if the student was an A-day or B-day student and they were absent on their in-person day, then it would count as their corresponding A-day or B-day absence. So if we look at the totals, there's 93 A-day absences, 97 B-day absences, 86 virtual Wednesday absences, and then 155 remote absences. And that data is from our five elementary schools. Our high school and our middle school administrators are currently finalizing their student attendance data, and we will be sharing that out at a future board meeting. And we will continue to be monitoring our student attendance monthly. When we're looking at our staff and teacher attendance, we looked at the period beginning September 14th through September 30th. Um, we did not have the data when this report was created for 10-1 and 10-2. Um, the data for staff and teacher attendance goes through a system called WinCap, which is our district's financial and human resources management system. So if you turn to page two, we had 141 teacher absences and 204 staff absences. And when I say staff, I mean all employee groups other than teachers. I did compare those absences to the same period in 2019, and they are comparable. Additionally, we looked at the virtual Wednesday absences for our teachers and staff, and it's important to know that the absences on the Wednesday account for approximately 22% of the total absences, which suggests we're not seeing higher rates of absenteeism on the virtual Wednesday. Mr. Simons also had indicated that we are required to complete a New York State Department of Health survey daily, um, and it's called the state report card. It's on the dashboard. One of the questions is regarding the number of school referrals to a health care provider, and the New York State dashboard breaks this question into three categories. One is number of student referrals since the last report. 
The second is number of teacher referrals since last report. And lastly, number of staff, excluding teacher, referrals since last report. So on page three, you will see a chart broken down by school building. And our secondary schools are on this chart. Um, and you will see that our secondary schools, Columbia High School and Golf Middle School, have the highest number of students being referred to a medical provider for symptoms of COVID. So during that first several week period, Columbia High School had 40 students referred and Golf Middle School had 49 students referred. These student referrals are either occurring if a student comes into school, they're well enough in the beginning of the day, but they may come down with symptoms by the afternoon and they're sent home and they're referred to a doctor. Other instances are parent or guardian is calling the school, informing the school nurse that their child has a symptom, looking for some guidance. Our school nurses have been doing a wonderful job of directing those families to a medical provider um, and proceeding that way. For our teachers and staff, if Mr. Gunn, if you can scroll a little bit further, you'll notice that this, there's a big difference. We only have five teachers being referred to a healthcare provider and only one staff member. So our employees are taking it upon themselves. They're feeling sick. They're informing their building principal or supervisor that they've already had the appointment scheduled. Um, so we're seeing less medical referrals on the employee end. And then on the last page, we have analyzed the leave time that is provided by the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. This is a federal leave that requires certain employers to provide their employees with paid sick leave and expanded family medical leave benefits. Right now, these provisions will apply through December 31st, 2020. Employees who utilize this leave are responsible for completing our district's COVID leave request form. We use this form to track that leave, but we also use the form so the employee can indicate out of the six categories of the FFCRA, what bucket do they fall into? And then corresponding documentation needs to be provided. So for the 9-14 to 10-2 time period, we had a total of 12 teachers out on the federal leave and a total of four staff members. Those absences are specifically related to COVID. So either they're caring for their family member that might be sick, they've been directed to quarantine by a federal or state um, or local government, they themselves are symptomatic, or potentially their child's school or daycare was shut down and they need to take some leave. So with all of those absences, we need to look at how does that impact our substitutes. We are seeing that a lot of our substitutes um, are not as able as they once were to accept positions in our district, whether that be um, due to some, some concerns due to fear, or whether they themselves have moved on to other careers. Um, but we broke down the substitute fill rates by building, and at Belltop, it was a 90% fill rate, Columbia High School, 95%, DPS, 11%, Janae, 92%, Goff, 88%, Green Meadow was 100% fill rate, and Red Mill was 100% fill rate as well. The overall substitute teacher fill rate for the month of September was 82%. As compared to last year, September 2019, the fill rate was 99%. So we are feeling um, the lack of substitutes. I'm currently openly recruiting for additional substitutes. Um, but we are, in our district, having a hard time filling those roles. Um, but it's also the capital region in general um, has been having a hard time locally with substitute coverage. Does anyone have any questions? Any questions or comments from Marissa on the data? Any other conclusions, Mr. Simons or Mr. McHugh, that you can draw from? The, I just want to point out that the 11% at DPS, because it is a smaller school with smaller staff, as I understand it, our incidents were one or two. 
teacher positions have not been filled on a regular when you say fill rate if you could define that a little bit more because the number is very low at dps but i think it's one or two so the fill is not covered the fill rate is the number of teacher absences not filled by a substitute so 11 percent of the time at dps they do have substitute coverage but when you drill down when you look at the absences that 11 percent might be two absences weren't filled on that given day because we're looking at a very small period of time. Thank you. In low numbers. I think, I mean, looking at the fill rate actually is compared to the region, I'm sure it's very, very good. Yeah. <laughs> it <laughs> is good compared it, to the region. It's, 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 we're, I think we're actually pretty fortunate. I think the data um, is helpful. I think that it shows too that with our students who are absent, you know, we need to have mechanisms for them to make sure that they can make up the work, get the work they need. Um, from our teachers and I hope that there's flexibility in there so that uh, those students who, who may miss school for whatever reason health-wise can uh, can get that material and, and still continue to stay on uh, track with their peers. All right. We'll now move to uh, the discussion of the proposed timeline for a superintendent's evaluation. I had sent this out to the uh, the board and Mr. Simons if you open that up um, on your Chromebooks, you can see the timeline. Put a little pressure on Mr. Simons if, uh, in terms yep, of the, I'm feeling it, Mr. Bionel. Uh, okay. <laughs> if, uh, <laughs> if we need to make a little adjustment there, we do have some time in the window um, to do that. But I think uh, the biggest thing for us is that, as a board, that November 4th, if all goes well in terms of the timing, we'd like to do is do a board retreat on the 4th. And I, I put that out to everybody and everyone seemed pretty open to that. And then we'll um, do for, for Frank and for Deanna, we've set up uh, accounts in SuperVal, which is our, our electronic system for the superintendent evaluation. We can set up some time with myself. Mark is familiar with it. We'd be glad to sit down with you to go through the process um, and how that works in a session, okay, prior to that. Any other comments that that time frame look good for everybody? Kathleen, good. good. Okay. Moving on to committee reports. Marissa, you're on again. Just a quick status update on our instructional vacancies. We do have a number of teaching assistant vacancies that are unfilled. We have uh, two full-time TA positions in the district, one at Columbia High School and one at Golf Middle School. A total of 22 candidates applied for those two roles. Columbia High School selected six candidates to interview in the first round. Goff Middle School selected seven candidates to interview in the first round. Um, we have two finalists coming in for interviews for Goff tomorrow, and we have two finalists for the Columbia High School role um, coming in tomorrow as well. So hopefully um, those recommendations for appointment will be on the 1021 personnel memo. Uh, additionally, we have a part-time teaching assistant opening at Goff. Our candidate pool um, was a little low on this one with six candidates applying. And out of those six candidates, only two individuals accepted an interview. Um, so we will be moving those um, selected into the final round. Um, and that is tomorrow, 1015 as well. And then the last TA opening is a five hour position at Columbia High School. Unfortunately, eight individuals declined that interview, so we will be reposting um, and hoping to widen our candidate pool. <laughs> Lastly, we have an elementary position at Belltop. It's grade two. There were 72 candidates. Mr. Mahar conducted first round interviews the week of 10-5. Mr. Simons, Mr. Mahar, and I are conducting the final interviews tomorrow afternoon. Great, thanks for missing. I did uh, notice the addendum for the COVID coordinator, which is great that we got that filled. Yes, so we're very excited. Our COVID coordinator is going to be starting on Thursday, October 22nd, um, and she's going to be very busy. I bet. <laughs> we appreciate uh, all the work that went into that and, and, and the new person coming on board. Moving to business and finance. Okay. I have no reports at this time. Okay, thank you. Mr. Simon, Safety Committee. Uh, yes, our first Safety Committee meeting was held on October 5th. We had a virtual meeting that began at 6 o'clock. Uh, we uh, 
uh, have minutes posted on board docs. Uh, if any board members who are unable to attend the meeting uh, want to review those minutes or have any questions or concerns, I'd be happy to address them. Uh, after introducing everybody on the committee, uh, we had a discussion about what the committee felt would be some priority objectives that align with the board's goal. The board has always had a health and safety goal. Uh, these priorities are still a work in progress. Uh, one of the suggestions was to implement and monitor the evaluation of our safety drills this year in light of new guidance from New York State related to uh, fire drills, uh, lockdown drills, and how those drills can be operated under a modified schedule. For example, you're operating in a hybrid, you don't have all the students there at once. Uh, we are able to um, still have the same number of drills, but those drills do not have to be doubled in according to the state so that every student um, um, receives those. Additionally, under a lockdown situation, typically we would move everyone into uh, a confined area of the room or, and, and with the social distancing requirements, we are able to provide verbal instruction and or modeling of how that would occur in the event that there was an actual emergency, but we don't necessarily have to have all the kids clustered together in the corner of a room. Uh, our principals have already been conducting our uh, safety drills and we are uh, pleased with how it's going so far. Additionally, um, we talked about the requirements that are in place for health and safety checks uh, in every building, how the temperature checks, the social distancing, the signage, the wearing of masks was going. Uh, I invited any input from the committee regarding what, um, uh, how things were going. Uh, gen in general, people felt uh, there's a, in the initial first couple of days, kids took some time to get used to things and staff, but it was generally going very well. Uh, we added some technology at the middle school and the high school, thermal scanners to take temperatures more uh, easily, uh, which seemed to be operating very well. Uh, additionally, uh, the, the safety committee will serve in a role to continue to monitor some of the protocols that we normally would have in place. For example, SRO Jeff Russo, our deputy sheriff from the sheriff's department said, you know, we, 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 we for years trained people in the single point of access, single point of entry procedures, the visitors protocols and now as we are trying to keep people coming into the building separate example the kids we want to just make sure that there's still a general vigilance in every school about um, how kids are moving into the building how visitors are handled additionally uh, we um, talked about the fact that the district wanted to do a school climate survey we were ready to go with the school climate survey in march of last year then COVID hit we talked about some of the national and statewide issues going around regarding discrimination and tolerance and acceptance. There was a feeling on the part of the committee that despite the fact that we're operating a hybrid model right now, the climate survey was critically important to do. So we'll be reconvening the subcommittee that worked on the survey and we'll be putting together a timeline to do the climate survey. That survey would go to all of the staff members, all of the parents, and all of the students, including those students that are in the hybrid model or in the full remote model. It's the US Department of Education standardized climate survey to gauge how well we're doing in various areas of school climate and safety. And I'm looking forward to implementing that and uh, reviewing the results. There were a number of um, other topics uh, addressed in terms of uh, things that are going on related to safety. We did talk specifically about reunification procedures in the event that we have to evacuate a building, bring kids to another site and uh, connect kids with their parents. Under the current um, situation with COVID-19, we wanna take a closer look at how that might be done procedurally to manage kids and staff so they're not um, uh, being congested together. So our committee will pick that topic up at the next meeting. Lead, lead testing plan is being developed by Paul Bickle and Sam Beersley, who is our health and safety and risk management consultant from Questar. And they've indicated that the testing maps, which are the, the taps and the uh, faucets that need to be tested, uh, have been mapped out and uh, they're developing sample plans to carry out the testing. Our next meeting will be, I don't 
have our next meeting listed on there, but I will let you know when the next meeting is. Thanks, Mr. Simons. Is there any uh, questions or comments for, for Jeff? I just want to say I want to thank the committee. I know this, uh, we're dealing with all things COVID, but there's a lot of other safety areas that have to be addressed. And I particularly want to thank the committee for looking at the, uh, the climate. Um, the fourth bullet priority objective was, was particularly important to make sure that uh, we're addressing anything that we, uh, any needs. And it's really good to see the messages from our high school student council members about the positivity and the climate and making it really uh, a positive environment uh, with all the challenges that we're facing. And um, uh, I think that seeing the amount of involvement that wants to take place in that area is, is really encouraging. So thank you, looking forward to that. Okay, finished up committee reports. We'll now move to the uh, approval of draft minutes. Any revisions or corrections to the draft minutes? Michelle, you are marked as not here from last time, right? So you'll abstain. Any questions? No. If not, I need a motion to approve the minutes. Joanne, second. Kathleen, all those in favor? All those abstaining? Michelle, approved. Next, moving to the approval of programs for resident children with disabilities. Any questions or comments on those? If not, I need a motion to approve that. John, I need a second. Mark, all those in favor? Approved. We have a first reading of policy on the agenda. Mr. Simons or Linda? Uh, yes, we sent the policy out to the policy committee. Uh, it is the regulation and the form related to student use okay. of the computer network. The, the regulation was modified to include language regarding unauthorized recording of yep. uh, virtual lessons. Um, the policy committee had no objections uh, at moving it forward. Great. And that's the policy with back to committee that we had a previous. Yes. Okay, good. All right, excellent. So we'll see that hopefully in the next agenda, uh, next meeting agenda for second meeting and approval. Uh, table motions, I don't have any. Um, old business, board members, anything? No. Moving to the consent agenda, we have several items. We have tenure, we have instructional, non-instructional, financial reports, a lot of information here. Um, any uh, comments, questions? Yes, Joanne. Sure. Um, I spoke to Mr. Simons a couple weeks ago um, regarding that. And my question to him was, in view of everything being remote, in view of the fact that the kids are not really in school afterwards, what are we doing to make sure these clubs and activities are functioning as they should? Um, Mr. Simons told me that the oversight and monitoring is falling on the building principals to add yet one more thing to their workload, um, but they are responsible for checking on attendance, checking the number of students, and reporting back to Mr. Simons. Um, it's my understanding, based on the discussion with Mr. Simons, that these stipends are contingent on filling obligations associated with these um, appointments. Um, and I don't know how everyone else would feel, but I personally would like to ask if we could consider having a monthly report um, as far as attendance and number of students at these meetings. I have no objections to that. Thank you. That'd be a good idea. If, um, if we do find monthly challenging, I think, you know, it would be okay to have like every two months join. I don't know how frequently some of these committees meet, or the, I'm sorry, the clubs. I Mon guess as we go on, I wouldn't have a problem. With okay, so it, start with to monthly. start, because my understanding is the first payout is it in December, correct, That's right. Mr. Simons? I believe it's January. 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 Okay. okay, okay. I mean, seeing as it's October now, we would sure. at least need a couple reports to really make an informed decision. Very good. Okay, very good. All Thank right. You. Everyone support that? I support it. John supports it. Good. Everyone supports it. And, and the principals are how are they monitoring? Are the teachers, are these club advisors reporting to them? Are they asking them? They'll be requesting information uh, from the club advisors. So they just look at some of these, just don't know how they'll be able to operate remotely. 
some yeah. of some of the, the, the uh, activities that are, that are listed here. I just don't see how they can operate. The so ones that we felt could not at this point, based on discussions with the principals, have not been put on the agenda. Particular one, you might have a question about it. For example, Joanne asked me some questions about the um, the choral groups, concerts, and those kinds of things. Uh, the plan would be to conduct virtual concerts. Uh, and I know that those groups are rehearsing, and I know that as we get closer to the concert season, uh, the intent was for those those performance groups to perform virtually. Are there other ones that are questionable? Or well, you I mean, they're not going to give any of these organizations that people on, but how can you do a drama club remotely? Which is play and events. And how, how is that? I just like to know skits. I'll get more information from the advisor, but this is some of these. They can do skits. I'm not a drama coach. But, uh, <laughs> I don't know how to drama. I'll ask the drama teacher, but I think they can do skits. They can do individual uh, acting classes. They can do other types of things uh, virtually. Uh, they can do individual. They can do. They can bring groups together virtually. It depends on how they want to do it, similar to the way that our virtual graduation ceremonies and our award centers brought together. I think that is the intent, what the status of it is right now. Mark, I don't know. I'll check. I'll get more information on those areas. Yeah. But, uh, I just thought of something, Jeff. Now, backing this up, our Appendix D stuff and the clubs, is there a lesson plan or some type of plan that is in place at the start of the year for the club's activities as they go through, you know, a goal, objective, or what, however they, some type of structure? There, there is not a standardization of that right now. One of the things I will bring up is that we have asked and negotiated through the new teacher contract that there be a standardized evaluation of the clubs. And as part of that evaluation, again, it is still subject to discussion within the Appendix D committee, you would envision that uh, the goals uh, for the club would be identified at the beginning of a year, and then the evaluation would be tied to the uh, how successful was the club advisor and the students at achieving those goals. But that isn't a discussion. I don't want to get ahead of the Appendix D committee, but that that would be a good opportunity in the discussion of an agreed upon evaluation to get at some goal setting and some uh, mm -hmm. some uh, success measures that typically we would have, for example, in other academic areas. Right. I think Marissa that, has started the uh, convening yeah. committee. Um, myself and Mr. McHugh are going to be meeting with the Appendix D um, committee on Monday the 19th. Okay. I just think, as we were talking, I think that's kind of that bridge. We're not saying that they don't have it, but for the board to justify the expenditure without the knowledge of, say, hypothetically, we have the Frisbee Club. Is the goal to throw the perfect disc? What is the goal? And that's what we need to find out as we move forward. And I want to say, a while back, we had asked for each club to give a short little, here's what we do. Here's when we meet. You know, are, are these clubs meeting weekly? Are they meeting yes. three times a week? And we were looking to build some type of a, a, a report as to, you know, again, like you know, just like with Johnson, what their goals are, what their mission statement is, what their weekly meeting schedule looks like. You know, is is uh, one student in the club? You know, does that substantiate a, a twenty three hundred dollar payment? You know what is what is the, the you know uh, uh, what is going to make that club worthwhile? Those are things that Marissa and Jim are working with the Appendix D committee to develop and implement. And, and just just for clarity for people and for you, Marissa, when you go to the committee, at least my intent is to have relevancy, and we have staff. Who are willing to volunteer and are doing clubs for free 
and we we want to have we want to have equity for everyone. And if so it's not I'm, I'm not singling anybody out of, you know, you know, but this is just about management and relevancy. And we have people who are putting a lot of time in and volunteering their time who should should be paid. I mean, they're providing a great service for our kids. So that please let the committee know that this is not, you know, a punitive action that it's just uh, best management practice. So I think, um, oh, do I? I just want to add in, I, I certainly am not minimalizing any of the staff's efforts. Um, you know, everything they do is wonderful. I will go out and say that I think when you look at this list that there are some staff advisors that are way uncompensated or undercompensated for what they are doing. Um, when you look at some of these clubs and activities that have historically met three times a week and you compare their compensation with others, um, I think the committee really needs to take a long, hard look at the number of kids, the number of meetings, the relevance, like Mr. Dunn said, are these the subjects or the appendix um, activities that the kids are really interested in? <coughs> The new contract also includes a provision within the Appendix D section that requires us to have a new compensation schedule developed and agreed to by, I think it's the beginning of next year, that would be not implemented necessarily this year, but would be implemented in the future. I can't remember the exact timeline, but the evaluation piece, reporting piece, and the compensation schedule is all part of a phase-in of some changes that the board has wanted regarding these appendix D clubs. And again, the board is in favor of engagement of the kids. They just want to make sure that the, mm -hmm. that the engagement is, um, is happening equitably and that the compensation reflects the workload of the advisors. And I think people need to understand when we look at the compensation, when we see a thousand, two thousand, some are only five, $600. But when you go through in total, I roughly totaled it up and there's $130,000. Um, and that's a big chunk of money for the school district to be paying. Yes. So uh, it sounds like I saw Marissa taking notes and <laughs> Monday is the meeting. So you'll carry the board's mm -hmm. um, thoughts about Appendix D and yeah. hopefully formulate the, uh, the conversation with the Appendix D committee. So I appreciate that. Any other uh, areas, comments, questions in the consent agenda? I do want to say, you know, we have um, folks up for tenure and congratulations to them. Uh, we wish we could do it in person as always. Um, maybe down the road we can do something, hopefully, like we do at the end of the school year, which we missed last year, to recognize them on their accomplishment. Anything else? Kathleen and Michelle, you're good? All right. So with that, I do need a motion to approve our consent agenda items A through N approval. We pull C for separate. Pull C for separate. Okay. So we'll go A, B, A through N, removing C. All right. Any objections? No. Okay, I need a motion to approve that. Deanna, second. Kathleen, all those in favor? Approved. So item C. Any questions or comments on that? If not, I need a motion to approve that. Joanne, a second. Frank, all those in favor? All those opposed? All those abstaining? No, Mr. Mann abstaining? Approved. Next, under uh, new business, we have a tax litigation settlement, the village at Miller Road, LLC. Who's going to comment on that? I will be Ms. Wager. Ms. Wager, okay. Yes. So this What's is this a, all about? This is a proposal for a tax litigation settlement on two properties owned by the village at Miller Hill, or Miller Road, mm -hmm. and uh, it's 77 Miller Road and 81 Miller Road, and they are for two tax years, the 2019 tax year and the 2020 tax year. Um, the assessed values in 2019 and 20 on the 77 Miller Road 
were 1.176 million. And they petitioned to have the assessed value reduced to 372,000, which uh, at those rates, at the tax rates for each year, exposed us to a 20,000, uh, over $20,000 refund each year. Uh, the proposed assessed value on this settlement is 785,000, which brings the proposed refunds on 77 Miller Road to 10,000 $22 in 2019 and $9,980 in 2020. On the 81 Miller Road property in 2019 and 2020, the assessed values were 1.8 million. They petitioned to have the assessed values reduced to 465,000, which our exposure was 34,218 in 2019 and over 34,000 in 2020. The proposal is to reduce the assessment to 1.25 million, which our proposed refunds then are $14,097 for the 2019 tax year and $14,039 for the 2020 tax year. And so we are requesting approval by the board for a total estimated for a total refund of $48,139 versus what would have been $100,000. Mm -hmm. Does that fall off so that's split with the town? That is all the district. And we have reserves. We have reserves to cover that. Yeah. And this was recommended by the e Ferrara for? Ferrara. For settlements? Yes. Okay. These are the parcels by Comfort Inn Mobile, that little spot there? Any idea? I do not know <laughs> okay. the I'm exact sure location. It. I'm pretty sure that's those buildings, right? I think it is. Okay. Yeah. Not 100% certain of it. Okay. Generally, the assessment reduction has to be agreed to by the school district and the town. And the town. That's correct. Okay. And it's, it's an agreement mediated by our attorneys and the town attorney. Okay. Where, they, where we're, we're in sync with what the town thinks is fair. Very good. All right. Any other questions or comments? If not, I need a motion to approve that settlement. John, second. Joanne, all those in favor? All those opposed? Approved. Next, we have our second public forum. Linda, any? There are no public comments. There are no public comments in the second forum. Uh, we have the Board of Ed forum. We kind of did it a little bit differently this year, but uh, this year, this meeting. Um, so I will go to around the, around the horn, I should say. Uh, Kathleen, anything? Um, actually, yeah, as we spent all the time talking about reviewing it. Uh-oh, we froze. You're back okay, on. I don't, I don't, we got a, one of our, we got a bad, I don't know if you can see we had a bad connection. We missed everything you said, Kathleen. Ah, okay, well, I was just saying that one of our third grade teachers was featured in the onboard magazine put out by the New York State School yes. Board Association showing um, her using Google Classrooms as her LMS. Right, awesome. So I was kind of excited to see that, and I'm glad we got to share that. So, yes, excellent. Great recognition. Michelle, anything? You're good. Joanne? I do have something I'd like to share. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I went online and happened to see a teacher's post. Um, you know, when we talk about the challenges of school right now remotely and everyone really advocating for their children as they should, um, teachers advocating for their kids, the administrators and parents, um, it just kind of puts a focus on the kids. And I just want to share what this one teacher wrote. Um, she had said that she had had a rough day, rough week, rough year, not just in regard to specific children. And she was just saying she opened her um, social media page and saw something that just made her incredibly happy. This was the message that she saw. Kind of just wanted to thank you so much for last year. If it wasn't for your support, I, wouldn't, I would be in a horrible spot right now. This year, I've been trying to keep on top of things. I know it's only been two weeks into ninth grade, but wanted to email you anyway. 
The Jump Start teachers are awesome. Um, put a shout out to one of the Jump teachers, Jump Start teachers that's helping her. So then she wrote, so yeah, I've got to go back to the bus right now. Again, thank you so, so much. I hope this year I'll be able to make the high honor roll. Um, and I, I want to shout out to Jen Venlins at Goff. Um, what a great tribute to her for a child to send an email out like that. Um, and also to Julia Daggio at the high school. Um, she was a teacher that was referred to in the Jumpstart. If the building principals could forward that information and congratulate them, I'd appreciate that. Very nice. Very nice. Thank you, Julia. Deanna? Yeah, you're good. Mark, anything? Uh, yeah, a, a question and a statement. One, I uh, want to thank all our uh, maintenance workers, our grounds workers, all our staff that uh, uh, cleaned up the schools and, and stuff like that from that uh, uh, freakish storm yeah, that we right. had last right. week. Um, I did see on the news they're calling it something. The weather event of some sort? Something, oh, yeah. something <laughs> freaky that doesn't normally happen around here. Right. right. Um, and Rancher County was hit pretty good. Yeah. Especially the town of New Springs. So I just yep. want to thank all the, you know, our folks that did all that work to get everything uh, cleaned back up and that had to come in and there's no power and stay late. Yep. So, you know, thank you. Um, did the district suffer any major damage at any of our locations? Just trees down. Uh, and um, mo mostly here at Red Mill, but uh, no no significant damage to any property other than the power being out. And I would mention that Phyllis Sanford and her husband came in on one of the power outage days to make sure that the golf uh, freezer food had oh, yeah. out and moved it to the high school, which is very much appreciated. Yes. No, no damage, um, significant guys did do a great job in our, in our, our, our custodians here. Yeah. Yep. So. Excellent. Good comments. Thanks, Mark. John? Just uh, another acknowledgement. Uh, through this difficult time, we've been Boston, vaulted into the world of technology. And uh, Peter, I want you to know that we appreciate it. The community appreciates. So please pass to you and your team that you are truly being tasked to your limit. And um, you are referred to, and your team, not just you, as the, the knights in shining armor. When the staff reaches out to you and your team on the behalf of these students uh, with the, all the different internet issues and things that you, you always uh, take a personal stake and response. So please let your crew know that the board really appreciates it. Uh, and I'm speaking on behalf of the community, that the community really appreciates you guys have been in overdrive since the 12th of March, and uh, we appreciate it. Very nice. Thank you, John. Frank? Uh, these are challenging times. I genuinely believe that this district is doing all it can to protect our kids, which is ought to be mentioned and recognized. So kudos to all of us, including the community. Excellent. Thank you, Frank. Uh, just a couple comments, too. Um, we, uh, we continue to make our road trip. Uh, we were at Red Mill. I wanted to thank Paul Bickle and Helen for a tour of the facility. Um, we got to see some of the capital project work that took place um, this past summer and a few months before that when we were shut down. And I really appreciate the community support for the capital project. It looks amazing. It's really uh, good to see. A lot of the stuff is, is kind of what not the uh, bells and whistles, but it's the, the, the infrastructure that supports a school. And, you know, looking at the gymnasium and the, um, you know, the logo there and the personalization for the school it really is great to see. Um, and I want to thank our construction folks and everybody who was involved with the project as it continues. But the, the work looks excellent. Um, very much appreciated. The other thing is uh, we did, I failed to mention earlier about new business. We do um, had a request from Dr. Cruz at Questar. She would like to visit the boards as she does every year. And if you could email me any topics that you'd like to have them discuss from the BOCI side, um, and we'll set up uh, something for them to come in virtually at some point in the next uh, in the school year. And um, 
any topics that you'd like to, to mention. And finally, just that we're all learning in this process. I try to think back to Dr. Bird's presentation, Jim, from, from when we had to shift uh, way back when and, and how, uh, you know, it really changed our world. And, you know, as we learn and navigate through uh, returning to school, it's important for everyone to, to be there for each other and know that we have the best interests of the community and our parents and our kids at, at heart. And we will continue to work hard for you um, on the best interests of our parents and family. So again, thank you. And we'll continue to do that hard work. Anything else? Anyone? I want to acknowledge a grave error I just made in, the, in supporting what Mr. Mann was saying about our crews and the cleanup. Um, yeah. I want to specifically thank Amy Sherman and Sherry Allen, who are two custodians here at Red Mill who are out early Thursday morning, clearing trees and branches with Frank Asenbrauer and her, and I think I use the term guys, so I apologize. Amy Sherman and Sherry Allen were out there uh, 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 picking up trees and uh, doing and cleaning the property, which looks much better than it did last Thursday morning. So I didn't want to let myself get away with that comment. Amy Sherman and Sherry Allen. Thanks, Mr. Sainz. Caught myself. Awesome. So if, if there's no other comments tonight, we do have need for an executive session for purposes of collective negotiations. Um, with that, we don't have any business after the meeting, so I do need a motion to go into executive session. Somebody? Joanne, I need a second. Michelle, all those in favor? All right. Everyone have a great night. Thanks again, Helen and the team for the, the tour, and we'll, uh, we'll be in touch soon, and we'll be on our next spot. We'll be... We are at uh, Green Meadow. Green Meadow coming up soon. Yeah. All right. Thanks, everyone.